I would like to welcome Jenna Dooley and Brandon Allen from the ABMI, who will be talking about our developing amphibian monitoring program. Take it away. Okay, thanks, Sid. Uh, I'm Janet, and I'm going to get us started, and then I will pass it off to, to Brandon to finish it off. So today, uh, we'll talk about a few things. The first thing, in case you missed Sid's intro that she just gave, uh, we'll go over a little bit of ABMI 101, basics and reminder of what we do generally. And then we'll get into the different data sets and where we collect data. Of course, the stars of the show, we'll talk about Alberta's amphibians, uh, how we sample them, a couple of collaborative projects that we're involved with. And then Brandon will go into depth about our main amphibian monitoring project, the analysis and the models that he has developed. So this is the first time that the results of these new and improved models have been, been seen publicly. So I'm very excited that he'll be able to share them with you. So just a quick reminder about ABMI in general before jumping into amphibians. This is our mission. We track changes in Alberta's wildlife and their habitats and our operating principles. We operate at arm's length from government and industry. We develop information products to meet stakeholder needs. All of our information is publicly available and we strive to make it easily understood. So that's partly where this webinar comes in. Um, and in the spirit of being accessible and transparent later on, Brandon will show you where you can find more information about the analysis, even dig into the code if that's your thing and how to reach out to us. So as far as where we monitor, I think we're best known for our ecosystem health program, which has sites in a 20 kilometer grid across the province. These grid locations are actually home to two different site types as part of the ecosystem health program. That's a random location often referred to as terrestrial that can fall into any number of habitats or human footprints. And then there's also a permanent open water wetland site that we collect data of. But we also sample off the grid. So I think the ecosystem health program that I just talked about is our largest and longest standing, but we also have other sampling projects that target specific taxa or habitats. So for example, we supplement our ecosystem health sites with off-grid sites that target specific human footprint types that aren't well represented in Alberta and therefore not sampled very often through the grid. Um, on the right-hand side of this slide, there's a map of sites from a project in 2020. This project was motivated by COVID and our inability to house and train the large number of field technicians that we usually do in the summer. Uh, so we got creative and we deployed 220 autonomous recording units or acoustic recording units to unique wetland habitats that we don't usually capture. And our target of this project was amphibians. So the logistics were pretty complicated because of changing COVID restrictions, but we were able to work with a few conservation organizations in the province and also private landowners to capture some valuable data under very strange circumstances. So that's an example of a project that was beyond the grid that we're best known for. We also partner with other organizations to sample. For example, we've been involved with multiple citizen science initiatives or as shown here in the top uh, left corner, the bioacoustics unit. The bioacoustic unit is a collaboration between ABMI and the Bain Lab at the University of Alberta. They have many projects that target habitats of specific species like Canadian toad or yellow rail. And then just one more example, we uh, collaborate and share data with the Boreal Avian Modeling Project. So that's just to give you an idea of, you know, the breadth of sampling that we do. 
we do have the grid and we get lots of data from that grid. And then there's also a bunch of supplemental efforts that um, add to our data sets. So what do we sample? Uh, as you can see here, there's various taxa that we sample, also habitat elements. Uh, we use various sampling methods specific to each taxon. This list does not include aquatic macroinvertebrates, but we sample those too. But for today, subject matter at hand, uh, we're talking about amphibians. So these are the amphibians of Alberta. Alberta is home to 10 amphibian species, two salamanders, three true frogs, three toads, one tree frog, and one species of spadefoot. So you can see them here on our very own amphibian walk of fame. They are cute little guys. And I mentioned that we use different sampling methods for the different taxa that we monitor. So this is just a schematic kind of showing how we generally gather data on amphibians. Um, Brandon and I are both gonna quickly go over one project each where we deviated a bit from this process, process but this method here covers the bulk of our sampling. Uh, the first step is the autonomous recording units. So these are actual machines that we're putting out in the environment and they are collecting acoustic recordings periodically throughout the day. So usually about 38 minutes of recording total in each day and those recordings are in one and three minute chunks. Second step is the transcription process. So that's just going from those acoustic recordings to lists of species that were present. Uh, the transcription process is managed in wild tracks and each unique species that appears in the recording is tagged. So we're using advertisement calls to identify amphibians and so what we're actually sampling is potential or maybe hopeful amphibian reproduction. So it's not necessarily successful reproduction, but we're recording those calls from the male frogs or, or toads uh, that are looking, looking to reproduce. And I mentioned that because I think it's important to keep in mind that we are sampling the presence of amphibians at a specific time in their life history. So if you can imagine, uh, it's impossible to describe or uh, transcribe all of the recordings that come back from the ARUs. Uh, there's hundreds of hours of recordings on them. So we subsample the available recordings and how you subsample those recordings for transcription can look different depending on your objectives. Um, but usually you're randomly selecting uh, specific times of recordings throughout the entire period that it was out in the environment uh, recording. Uh, I mentioned it quickly, but I wanna bring it up again. Uh, this whole transcription process, we do it in Wild Tracks, which is an online platform for managing, storing, processing, and sharing this type of data. Also uh, wildlife camera data. I won't go into details about wild tracks because there is an upcoming webinar in two weeks all about that. So if you're interested, you should definitely sign up. There's a lot of cool new features that have been added, added to wild tracks recently. Okay, and then the third or final step that I have here called data selection. This is basically you pulling the data that you need for uh, your purpose. So. We essentially use wild tracks as a database. You know, we've got all the available recordings uh, from all the different sampling points and wild tracks makes it easy to then download the data you need. So depending on what you're looking for, um, you would select from what's available and take what's appropriate. Okay, next slide, please, Brandon, thank you. Uh, I mentioned that I would briefly talk about some projects that we've been in, involved with 
this is one of them, the Amphibian eDNA Project. So I won't spend a ton of time on this. Um, it was a project that we did in collaboration with Enotech Alberta, uh, Brian Eaton's lab. And Brian and I both have sp spent some time discussing this project and the results from it in various forms. So if you are interested, please don't uh, hesitate. I'd be happy to give you to reach out to me. I'll give you some more details, but uh, I just have two slides here just to kind of give a brief overview of what we did, did in this project. So, um, we just went over the typical data gathering process for amphibians. Uh, this project is kind of in contrast to that, to that process because we were using eDNA methods. So eDNA or environmental DNA. Um, the overall goal of the project was to explore the use of environmental DNA to monitor amphibians. And in order to do that, we developed and tested primers for our various target species. Uh, primers are organism specific DNA fragments that are used to detect those organisms from the environmental sample that you're collecting. Uh, so basically, it's just the piece of genetic code that you uh, determine is the best piece to look for in that sample to be able to detect uh, that organism specifically um, related to other organisms that it might might be there. So there you have to do some testing in order to figure out the best piece of DNA uh, code that you want to use in order for it to be able to picked up be picked up the easiest. Uh, this project was in Edmonton. So our target species were the northern leopard frog, western tiger salamander, Canadian toad, uh, the western or boreal toad, and boreal coarse frog, and wood frog. So we did use ARUs um, as part of this project because we wanted to compare the data that we got from the ARUs to the eDNA methodology, but the real goal or purpose was to assess the eDNA methods. Next slide. So results, when we compared the eDNA approach to the ARU analysis, we uh, saw that both approaches gave similar results for most species, sites, and months. Uh, we had one instance in which the ARU detected a Western toad and the eDNA did not. We had some trouble with the boreal chorus frog primer. So that's that DNA fragment that we used to detect um, the boreal chorus frog. Although six individual primer sets were developed and tested, even the best one did not exhibit good sensitivity. That's what I was talking about, you know, being able to pick up that specific species, but not other species that are closely related to it. Um, so we are planning to do some more work with the redesign of that primer. Another result was that the tiger salamander was detected at two sites using the eDNA approach. Um, and since salamanders don't broadcast advertisement calls, the ARUs aren't able to detect them. So remember, I mentioned earlier, we're using those autonomous recording units and what we're recording and how we're picking up amphibians is those advertisement calls. So since salamanders don't use them, we're not able to pick them up with our typical methods. So we'd like to do a little bit more work with the some confirmation work with all of the primers and then specifically that boreal chorus frog primer. But this project showed us that eDNA methods have a lot of promise and we're going to continue to work with Enotech and explore those methods for amphibians and other taxa. Uh, in the end, it was, you know, eDNA is a good tool to have in our monitoring toolbox and we're glad that we're we're set up to use it and hope to continue to explore it. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Brandon. Thanks, Janet. Oh, that's lovely background material on all things amphibians and AVI. Um, so I just wanna first talk about another project that we're involved with. This is relatively uh, new, so uh, we've been in contact with Dr. Julie Lee Yaw out of the University of Lethbridge for the last few years. Um, and we finally have been able to develop a project with one of her students, uh, 
Gina Bergman, trying to determine um, kind of the best ways to develop and compare habitat models uh, that are developed uh, using different survey methods. So we've been able to provide them with a bunch of the data that AVMI has already collected, um, some of our model outputs, and they're going to use that information to perform some field surveys this year. Um, and that'll be used as kind of a validation data set to confirm the quality of our models and to see um, how the ARU models are performing compared to other um, available data, such as historic um, surveys or as just doing um, surveys on the ground with your eyes and ears. So we, this is again, very new, but we are very excited to be uh, working with this group of people and amphibians. So Janet's already mentioned that, yeah, the ABMI does a ton of sampling and we're working very closely with the BU right now um, on incorporating their data. Um, I just wanna give you a sense of what we've collected so far specifically for amphibians. So the ABMI started using ARUs back in 2015 and over the last six, seven years, uh, we have over 3,000 unique areas that have been sampled. Um, you can see in this lovely map on the left, um, all the different colors represent different projects or years that ABMI went and did surveys at. Um, and for the most part, we have samples throughout the whole province. We, we do acknowledge there's a few little gaps. Um, that northern portion of the province is notoriously challenging to do amphibian surveys in when you have to take helicopter rides to get out there. Um, so that's a, a high priority for us to eventually get out there, but we are hopeful that we'll be able to, to fill in these gaps um, in the coming years. And then from the bioacoustic unit side of things, um, they were definitely early adopters of ARUs. Um, they're, I think, one of the, the main contributors for why AVMI eventually ended up adopting them. And they had a bunch of surveys um, targeting wetlands in um, beginning in 2013. And these were related to Canadian toad projects um, and boil course frog projects. And you can see they're um, not as widely dispersed, but they are very dense grids of samples um, kind of throughout the oil sands region in that northeast corner of the province. Um, so there's about 1,300 unique locations that were surveyed. Um, and again, it's really, at this scale, it's kind of hard to see just how many locations are being surveyed in such a high density. Um, but it is really valuable in filling in some of the blanks of how amphibians respond to uh, linear features and to oil sands development. So as Jenna said, we're monitoring the vocalizing species of amphibians. Um, we've detected all species of amphibians so far in our data set, um, but the abundance of them definitely varies quite a bit. Um, boreal chorus frog and wood frog are definitely the most abundant species in our data sets. Uh, I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. Um, we have several thousand recordings of these species. And um, I think most people know boreal chorus frogs seem to want to exist everywhere and anywhere on the landscape. Um, so we, we don't want, seem to have any challenges with finding them using ARUs. Um, some of the, the kind of medium abundant ones that we have so far are Canadian toad and Western toad. Um, so we have several hundred recordings, which is still um, definitely more than enough recordings to be able to uh, look at some of the ecology of these species and identify habitat relationships. And then getting into more rare species um, are plain spadefoot and great plains toad, where we kind of have a few dozen detections in the province. Um, they're a challenging species, we think that um, some of their vocalization periods are tied to local weather events. You might need a heavy rainstorm to happen before they'll start vocalizing. So we might have recordings of them, but they're in that backlog of data that we haven't had anybody listen to yet. Um, so there's lots of interest in determining if uh, how we can go about listening to more of the data in an efficient way. Um, and then the least abundant species we have are northern leopard frog and Columbia spotted frog. Um, Colombian spotted frog is restricted to the kind of Rocky Mountains within Alberta. Um, we have very few samples in that location right now, so we're, we're not surprised that we haven't detected many of them. Um, but we are a little surprised that we have so few detections of northern leopard frog. Um, we have ARUs that are kind of scattered throughout their uh, known range in Alberta. And for some reason, we just aren't detecting them very well with ARUs. Um, so this might be something unique to the specific wetlands that they're using and occupying or the time of year that they're calling at. Um, so we're, we're very interested in understanding why 
this single species in particular, uh, we're not sampling very well with air use. So as Janet mentioned, um, these are the first time we're presenting results from this iteration of our models. Um, but this has been an ongoing process over the last few years. So starting last year, uh, we started to release the basic occurrence information that uh, the ABMI has collected as part of these amphibian surveys. Um, so if you had gone to the ABMI biodiversity browser, you could find basic detection maps for the province. Um, from there, we did create a kind of a draft set of species habitat models. Um, and with these, we knew that there was room for improvement. So in 2021, we uh, were lucky enough to be able to present the results um, as part of the amphibian and reptile specialist conservation group in Alberta um, that was held by Chris Kendall at the Alberta Conservation Association. And as part of that, we presented these results um, and kind of did a shout out to the local amphibian groups. Um, for anybody that was interested in reviewing our models and providing feedback. Um, and I'd just like to take a moment and thank the groups that did provide feedback. Um, I've already mentioned Julie um, out of the University of Lethbridge. Chris Kendall from the Alberta Conservation Association was really helpful in providing feedback. Um, and we were actually able to engage with a group out of Elk Island National Park as well. Um, that was really key in um, just providing valuable input on the ecology that these models were kind of suggesting um, and if they seemed relevant or not um, and if these groups would actually use the results of these models in their work going forward. So we did this whole review process, um, we synthesized the results, we updated our species models accordingly, so we made some tweaks to kind of the underlying code base, um, some of the habitats that we were looking at specifically, um, how we kind of treated water within this um, these habitat models, because a lot of amphibians use the edges of water. They don't use large center open bodied um, portions of wetlands. So it becomes a bit tricky to how to deal with that from a modeling standpoint. Um, and then we also uh, collaborated with the bioacoustic unit and acquired all of their data. So there was a, a kind of a large change in these models um, kind of during the less fall and winter. Um, and now we're in kind of the final phases. So we have these new models that I'll talk about a little bit. And um, we are just working on the new ABMI biodiversity browser. So everything is all almost ready to go. Uh, it should be publicly released, uh, hopefully very soon. Um, but yeah, we're just trying to get everything all reviewed and make sure that it's as, as useful and helpful to anybody that uh, wants this information. So I'm just going to talk about some of the results for two species today. I'm going to start with Canadian toad. That seems to be a favorite of many people in the province. Um, Canadian toads are, well, all frogs and toads are adorable little creatures. Um, they kind of, Canadian toads have this lovely kind of spottled um, texture on them. They make this really short, uh, like repeating short trill sound during their vocalization events. And they love to breed in wetlands and slow flowing streams. Um, but they do often breed in ditches, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, sometimes they don't seem to prefer man-made water bodies versus naturally occurring ones. And they do spend a lot of their time in upland terrestrial habitats. So after these breeding events, they kind of scatter into the, the surrounding upland habitat for foraging. Um, you can see on the map on the right, uh, they occupy kind of the eastern portion of the province. Um, and their abundance does vary on a kind of a latitudinal gradient. So what have we detected so far? Um, so again, to date, we have about almost 700 recordings of Canadian toads. And these are, again, very focused within that known range in Alberta. Um, you can see they're all occurring within the eastern portion of the province. We kind of have a high density up in northern Alberta around the Fort Murray area. Um, and we do have some getting detected in southern Alberta in the grasslands and parklands, natural regions. Um, it's kind of challenging to see with all of the overlapping dots, but there are lots of detections within these um, high density surveys that the bioacoustics unit is, is doing. It just becomes a bit uh, lost at this spatial scale. In terms of surveying uh, Canadian toads, they have a very clearly defined um, kind of breeding window. Um, they seem to start vocalizing around day 125, 130, um, 
and they go up to maybe day 160, 170. Um, so there's a, a fairly tight window of 30, 40 days that they seem to be active in. Um, so this, this type of information is useful for those that are wanting to survey this species. Um, if you went out in late July, you're probably not going to find any. If you time your survey, kind of that sweet spot of May to June, uh, you're, you're very likely to detect them in certain parts of the province. So using this data, uh, we built a few different species habitat models. Um, I'm only going to present the, the vegetation-based models that we have here. Um, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit more some technical details for those who are interested later, but the basic summary here is um, we were able to build a fairly robust habitat model. Um, so for those of you that know species models, um, we had an AUC score of 0 0.9. So this is a fairly um, accurate model based on the data we have. And you can see that we're, we're predicting that Canadian toad are going to be really abundant in these young tree bog habitats, um, some early pine stands, as well as your tree fens, your shrubby bogs, shrubby fens, graminoid fens, marshy habitats. Um, and that seems to mostly align with the, the ecological knowledge of the species that we have. When we look at the response to human footprint, um, some of the effects are um, very, very expected. So you can see in like crops and tame pastures, uh, we expect a very low abundance of the species. They just do not prefer um, a wetland within an agricultural field. That's, that's not what they would like. Um, however, we do notice that they um, are relatively abundant within urban industrial um, and rural industrial habitats. And this is something that we're, we're working on investigating right now is trying to understand um, why they seem to be preferring some of these urban industrial features. Is it that they allow for um, water to pool on them temporarily? So they're kind of these like temporarily breeding ponds that they seem to like. Um, there's some amphibians that really prefer um, open water or kind of these smaller wetlands that are able to warm up quickly. So if you're able to have a bit of a clearing on maybe a well pad um, that floods, but then gets lots of sunlight and warms up quickly, a lot of amphibians kind of like that warm little kind of sun baiting pool for them to, to breed in. Um, so we're, we're still very much kind of working on some of these details, but overall the, the ecology seems to make a lot of sense and our the experts that reviewed these models also agreed with that. Um, looking at kind of these regional or kind of effects um, that uh, human footprint is having on these species, uh, I'm going to talk about two types of uh, what we call sector effects. So I'm going to refer to under footprint sector effects first. So this is what happens when you replace a native habitat with a specific sector. Um, so say you replace a tree bog with some sort of agricultural activity. Uh, we find Canadian toad response negatively um, almost across the board. So if you take any of those preferred graminoid fen habitats and replace them with um, seismic lines, you do forestry activity, um, agricultural activity, we're going to get negative responses. Um, within that habitat type. Um, one interesting thing to note is that there does seem to be a local response um, in the positive trend for transportation. And this also aligns with kind of the ecology of the species that they aren't breeding on roads, but they like to breed on ditches. Um, so anywhere you have a road, you have a ditch. Um, so you get this association of, uh, this, or this positive association between Canadian toad and the transportation sector because of this. Um, moving away from kind of this local or under, under footprint effect, uh, we can talk about the same things at a regional scale. So looking at the whole population of amphibians in the forested part of the province. Um, so you can think of everything except for the grassland natural regions, kind of as a simplistic view of that. Uh, and overall, we aren't seeing uh, much change in the regional population. Um, so again, even though locally, if you've replaced a habitat uh, that, that Canadian toads seem to prefer with agriculture, um, that population is going to be negatively impacted. Regionally, there's not a lot of agriculture occurring within bogs and fens and swamps. It's not, uh, it's not where we like to build our, our crops or our tame pastures. Um, so we do see a slight negative impact overall, um, but in general, we're kind of getting a kind of a stable response of Canadian toads specifically to um, habitat modifications. 
So spatially, this is what this looks like. Uh, so you can see on the left here, we have the predicted current distribution of Canadian toad. Um, again, this, this lines very well with the known range maps of the species. Um, you kind of get some hot spots within uh, the parkland grassland area in the eastern portion there, uh, going all the way up through the Fort McMurray and oil sands regions. Um, we can look at this under a theoretical reference condition. So this is a scenario where we've actually removed all of the human footprint on the landscape and replaced it with what we think the native habitat was um, in, that, in that situation. And again, you can see there is maybe a slight increase of Canadian toad when we remove the footprint. Um, but overall, the difference is kind of minimal. We see a bit of a loss in some spots. We can see a little bit of a gain in others. Um, so kind of net overall, we aren't expecting Canadian toads to have been too impacted as a result of these habitat changes. But I do really want to emphasize this is only looking at one particular part of these amphibians' life cycles. Um, it's not looking at where they're foraging. Um, this doesn't or isn't able to capture the loss of wetlands. We know within southern Alberta and other parts of the province, many wetlands have just been lost. Um, and we don't have good land cover layers that represent that. Um, and we also aren't looking at things like pollution. Um, so there might be habitats that are still highly suitable overall, but the water quality within those wetlands is extremely poor. Um, so I, I don't want people to think, oh, the Canadian toads are 100% fine. We don't need to worry about them. Um, these are results of more just saying one aspect of Canadian toads ecology seems to be safe in terms of landscape modification, but we should still be concerned about pollutants and climate change and the loss of wetlands. Um, and more work needs to be done to emphasize some of those uh, concerns around amphibians. So the other species I'm going to briefly talk about is western toad. Um, this is, again, I think all amphibians are cute. Uh, you have a small creature with lots of warts on them, and I am a sucker for them. Um, western toads are unique. They have vocalizing and non-vocalizing populations. Um, so again, un unfortunately, the areas are not great at capturing non-vocalizing species. Um, so we're only looking at one subset of this population. But they do occupy a large variety of wetlands, uh, forests, meadows, scrublands um, outside of the breeding season. So they are, um, they like to occupy a large variety of different habitat types. And kind of opposite to Canadian toad, they seem to occupy most of the uh, western portion of the province, kind of throughout the Rocky Mountains mountains and central um, forests of Alberta. Um, similar to Canadian toad, uh, we have a lot of data. Um, we have 324 recordings of them, which is great. Um, you can see on the occurrence map, we're actually detecting them quite far east in the province, um, which I don't think is unexpected. I think some of the range maps may be underestimating their range and when you talk to some of the, the ecologists and biologists that are on the grounds doing surveys, um, some of them don't seem that surprised that Western toad is slowly um, kind of creeping over to the, the eastern side of the province. Um, but also similar to Canadian toad, uh, we have a very tight window for their uh, vocalization um, events of their breeding season. So again, kind of starting around day 125, you start seeing a, an influx of uh, vocalizations and by day about 170, 175, um, those seem to subside quite a bit. Um, so again, this is really important for just helping inform when you do your field work. Because um, again, if you're going out in late July, you're probably not going to detect the species and that's going to inform your, your management actions on the landscape. Looking at uh, these vegetation models that we've developed, um, it's not as good as Canadian toad, but I, I feel like this is nothing to turn your nose up at. Um, so again, for those of you that are interested in model statistics, we had an AUC score of 0.86. Um, so still more, more than usable for most applications. Um, and we see that the species seems to, we're predicting it to occupy a lot of kind of mid, uh, mid age pine and deciduous forests, um, these old tree bog habitats, um, as well as kind of some of these treat swamp um, and shrubby swamp habitat types. Some of the, the interesting things with this species is that um, we don't observe the same responses to human footprint. Um, 
So they seem to be maybe a little bit more abundant in crops. It's still not a preferred habitat type, um, but it's not as drastic as the response to of Canadian toad. And when we actually look at things like tame pasture and rough pastures, um, they don't seem to be as impacted to the same degree. Um, so they seem to maybe be a bit more robust to various types of footprints on the landscape. And I also want to talk about one, I think it's kind of a, a really interesting result of these models is um, along all of these forested types on the left, so your white spruce pine, deciduous and mixed wood stands, um, you can see these green bars um, that seem to be above everything else. Um, those are representing uh, harvested areas um, within those stand types. And this species, according to our model, seems to really prefer harvested areas. Um, it, it's a little bit of a, again, it's an interesting thing that we're looking into. There seems to be a lot of literature uh, in places such as Vancouver Island that have found that western toads seem to prefer cut blocks. Um, again, you kind of get this, these areas where if you have uh, water that's able to accumulate for long periods of time to create suitable breeding habitat. Um, you stick it in the middle of a cut block, it warms up quickly, you get lots of biodiversity occurring there. Um, and so they, these western toads think that is the, the greatest thing ever. Um, so again, it's, it's one of those slightly confusing things. We often think that all footprint activities of the landscape always cause negative results. Um, and sometimes that's not true. Sometimes it is this kind of push-pull of harvest areas seem to maybe be beneficial for western toad in this aspect um, and that's just one species you have to consider when you're talking about the whole biodiversity of a landscape when we look at the sector effects um, so again starting with these under footprint or these local effects um, we see agriculture and urban industrial activities um, on average seem to be reducing um, suitability of habitats whereas energy footprint, so this is specifically looking at things like seismic lines. Um, Western toads seem to prefer um, forestry, as I mentioned, they love cut blocks based on our models, um, as well as transportation. So those kind of verges and ditches that um, road infrastructure makes also seem to, to be good habitat uh, for this species. And slightly different to Canadian toad, which kind of saw very flat regional responses. Um, we are seeing a bit more of a positive response of Western toad to um, these feature types. So you're seeing low double digit responses of um, energy and forestry footprints, um, which again, it, it's kind of interesting and it's hard to, it's one of these things we really wanna make sure is correct and that um, that these species seem, or this Western toad species seems to be increasing within forestry habitat. Um, again, it's one part of its ecology, um, so take it with a grain of salt and don't make all of your management decisions based on these results. But um, from a habitat standpoint, cut blocks seem to be a positive response or a positive thing for the species. And spatially, um, this is what it looks like. So yeah, we have our current distribution, which aligns quite well with the northern range maps. Again, you have um, kind of all through the foothills and Rocky Mountains. Um, kind of high abundance of the species and it pushes all the way into central Alberta, kind of around Slave Lake area. Um, under a reference condition, we actually see a lower overall abundance. And again, this is these influxes of mostly forestry on the landscape. Um, and you can see on the difference map on the right that we've, we've seen kind of large gains um, in suitable habitat for a Western toad. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a promising um, or interesting result that uh, we wanna look into further. So as Janet mentioned, um, at the ABMI, we're really keen on trying to make sure all of our data is accessible and how we do things is accessible. Um, so I didn't go into the nitty gritty details very much today, um, but for those of you that are interested, you can uh, find the technical documentation uh, that supports all of this, this modeling effort um, at our a ABMI GitHub page. Uh, so the, the link is at the bottom and Sid is gonna send this out as well. Um, so within this repository, there's a nice clean technical document so you can look at how we create these vegetation models, some soil models, um, the types of footprints that we've used, climate responses, um, how we process all of our ARU data. Um, that's all freely available for you to look at. Um, and I've also provided the code base behind everything as well. So I know that's not for everybody, but uh, there are some people that like to go through our code and 
uh, make sure things line up um, as expected. So if anybody wants to, to dig through our code, it's, it's all freely available for you to, to look at. Um, and I am always very happy to answer questions as well. And again, this was also mentioned. So we're doing a very big update to the biodiversity browser. I want to thank everybody in the information center that's working on this. Um, so there's going to be a new landing page for amphibians with some background information that we're really excited about. Again, unfortunately, it's not available as of today, but it should be very soon. Um, so all of these maps and results of sector effects um, and um, the coefficients associated with these species habitat models will all be available on here. So if you kind of want a um, straight to the point summary for amphibians, uh, this is the best spot to go to. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think we're all very excited that this is gonna be out there for people to start using and viewing. Um, yeah, and with that, I just wanna thank everybody. So yeah, I wanna thank Janet a lot. Uh, she is our wetland ecologist and she has been extremely valuable in helping improve these models and just trying to think about all the intricate parts of amphibian ecology that are sometimes challenging to, to wrap your head around. Um, and I also wanna thank um, Alex McPhail, who is our wild track coordinator. Um, so without the wild track platform, we just don't, we wouldn't be able to sort all of the data that we have. Uh, so we are very thankful for that. So if you have any questions, uh, myself and Janet are happy to answer them. Great, thanks for that great presentation. I'll just stop the recording.